can't hear anything, she'll mm -hmm. call me and let me mm -hmm. know there's a problem. Oh, wow, it's like infinite loop. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, we're going to use that for an art project. <laughs> All right, can everyone's attention? Uh, I want to introduce our speaker for today. This is uh, Margaret Chung. She's a professor from the University of Houston and a, um, a specialist in uh, computational biophysics. Mm. Um, you know, she's done a lot with uh, UH Clear Lake in the past, um, you know, with uh, our physics program and, um, you know, some of the things that we've done collaboratively. Uh, if anybody's interested in graduate school at UH, like working on your PhD, she's a good person to talk to. Mm. Um, and uh, also, another thing is that she was the PI on um, a supercomputer that we use up at UH called uh, UHPC. Uh, and so if you'd like to know anything about supercomputing or about some of the resources that are available uh, to us in the UH system, she's also a good person to talk to. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Chuck. Uh, thank you, Professor Garrison. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a wonderful, beautiful building. Uh, just a little bit of advertisement about the UHPC is free. So you can just basically apply for an account, and then you can have um, all the resources, one of the fastest computers on, on campus to run your simulations and your research project. Today my talk will be to introduce or discuss the physics of memory and learning from the perspective of interacting biomolecules. So before I get into the nitty-gritty details about my research, I like to provide a bigger picture. Why am I interested in this problem and why this problem is of interest to physicists? Or how could physicists would ever try to tackle such a complex problem? So what is the biology of memory and learning? And I quote from um, one of the Nobel laureate in 2000. He received a Nobel Prize in medicine and physiology. He, he said in his autobiography, the new biology posted that Consciousness is a biological process that will be eventually explained in terms of molecular signaling pathways used by interacting populations of nerve cells. So it's basically have nailed down the computing unit that stores our um, memory and learning to be some small molecules inside a, a digital or inside the nerve cells. And the question is, how do neural cells communicate? Uh, there is an interesting concept. Neurons, they are in touch without touching. So how do we know the physiology of these neural cells? It's actually discovered by a neuro, a neurophysiologist, San Diego Ramon y Cajal. What he, his uh, favorite activity would be to stain different uh, brains, brain tissues from uh, either human or either some other mammals, and then slice it thinly and observe them under the microscope. So at that time, it was believed that inside the brain, everything is just um, you know, comprised of a, a, a bag of gooey stuff. But Cahal mentioned, well, it's actually formed by um, very organized neurons and these neurons talk with one another and they are in close proximity and there are very very tiny gap between these neurons and these gap are called synapse so if we zoom in using a cartoon to represent what happened at these uh, interface and we can see that you have a small synapse uh, so it's called presynaptic material the receiving side called postsynaptic neurons. And how the two communicate is through the release of chemicals or proteins or serotonins. So what happened is you can ha have a bag of these chemicals or biomolecules being synthesized and then delivered to the edge of the presynaptic terminals and release it on, upon stimulation. So how do memory um, and learning occur is that once these type of activities happen again and then again, it will stimulate the growth and then the shape changes of the synapse. So there's a word in neuroscience say, practice makes perfect. 
It is because it has shown by training the mouse multiple times to do a certain routine that their synapse will become very different. And that marks the molecular that marks the cellular level of learning, that you need to have some kind of act, connectivity connecting to uh, interacting neurons. And then the geometry and connectivity can be shaped by your learning experience. Okay. So the next question will be, how does a neuron ex decode extracellular signals? So we know that this in our brain is actually a bunch of uh, neuron cells, they are in close proximity, and they are chemicals uh, diffusing across the synapse gaps. But how do they actually decode it? How do they know what they say? All right. So there are several things that has been known as uh, in the science community that we use calcium as a form of signaling tools. So calcium are abundant in milk. That's why we drink milk. We know calciums are good for our bones, for our muscles, but we also need that for our neurons to communicate with one another. And once the calciums are able to transmit information, then what happens? Underneath that neurons resides a lot of proteins called calcium binding proteins. They will catch or going to try to recruit or bind these calcium molecules and then encode into information, deciding whether they wanted to activate or deactivate a certain pathway. For example, if a pathway for us to learn and a pathway for forget go through the same molecule. So how do this molecule know whether this information means for a remember or forget? So in order to understand the connectivity, the physics of these pathways, we call protein-mediated calcium signaling pathways. It sounds a lot of like biology, but I'm going to break it down into a physics problem. So one thing that updated, that oh, a step closer to uh, being a physics problem is that we want to know how things change with time, how things change with space. So this is one of our mission is once we uh, receive the signal, so you have uh, learned about signaling processing in your advanced labs, and we would like to know how these patterns or how these frequencies or amplitude of these signals would translate into some certain meaningful uh, information that tells the neuron cell whether you wanted to forget or you wanted to remember. So let's get to a step closer. Zoom it in. Here is a stained neuron cell. It's about 20 micrometer. Meter. If you zoom it in, you see there are lots of protrusion growing on these dendrites. And these are called dendritic spines. The dendritic spines are where it's where the, the connect, connection with the other root neurons through synapse. So if I blow this dendritic stem up into a cartoon, as any typical pages show on biological textbook, then it shows a bundle of uh, calcium activating proteins. Upon the stimulation, calcium will be allowed to enter inside these dendritic spine and calcium signal will be relayed passing through a bunch of proteins through phosphorization. And the outcome of this, uh, this uh, information relay is the reorganization of the cytoskeleton called acting filaments. They can either break down, so as a result, the entire volume of the dendritic spine uh, shrank, or they can grow triple the size, and we can uh, that, that um, denotes to uh, memory learning, OK? So as I mentioned, I want to break this down into a physics problem. Obviously, learning and memory takes from seconds to days and require repetition for multiple times, multiple hours, to in order to grow or, or to consolidate a memory information. What I can do now today is I focus on what happened at the first second. 
So despite that, learning and memory could last forever. You know, that's why we still remember what happened a decade ago. But thinking about the protein's lifetime only usually lasts a few minutes. How does this information actually can be retained for that long period of time? So my first step question is to understand it, what happened the first second. The first second, uh, before the calcium uh, was allowed in, there is a protein called homodulin, and we call it in basal state. Everything is quiet. Homodulin will be sequestered by a protein called neurogranin, so this, this protein will not, be, will not randomly activate any meaningful um, downstream signals, proteins. And upon stimulation, such as binding of a glutamate, serotonin, or doing drugs, and then you have sudden stimulation of these calcium still coming in. It will activate the, this protein, and then it will bind calcium and a certain activate downstream kinases. We call it comodulin regulated proteins. And these cycles will, will lead to changes in synaptic, synaptic efficacy, to either grow to remember or shrink to forget. OK. So this is what we know in 2005. And after a, few, a decade, we know more about these proteins at the molecular level. We know that comodulin is a protein with 148 amino acids. It's like a polymer. We know that uh, using biochemical experiments, we can understand the binding affinity between comodulin and its interacting partners, such as neurogranin. Or uh, chyme kinase 2, a chyme, chyme, comodulin, calcium comodulin dependent kinase. And we, you typically experimentally use a small peptide as a model to understand its kinetic binding uh, mechanisms. So how do we actually uh, try to understand these binding kinetics? Within the first second when calcium rushed through, what happened? And we know comodulin is structurally flexible, so they are not really hard as a solid. They can actually flex, just like a muscle. That's why we are made of soft materials. And then it can adopt distinct conformations when they need it to. So let me tell you some story about comodulin. It, is, uh, it has uh, two domains connected by a linker, shaped like a dumbbell. It binds to four calciums, two at each site, and when it binds with a target peptide. What happens is it will change its uh, conformation. So this lobe will wrap around the target and form a canonical complex. And interestingly, for com uh, comodulin, inter it can interact over 300 targets. So how did comodul comodulin know which target to interact, or which pathway to activate? This is in close collaboration with uh, faculty at UTH at the Medical Center, Neil Waxon. So one of the things about doing biophysics research in Houston is that we are at the center of the world's largest medical center. So there's a lot of interesting research collaboration going on. Okay. So the first questions we can ask, uh, a simple question, we can ask ourselves is that how does the sequence variations would affect binding? So we know there is a small peptide called chyme, uh, chyme kinase 2. And there's another small peptide called chyme kinase 1. They have this, the same number of amino acids. They have the same net charges to mean that how many charged amino acids there are. And the only differences are um, the position of the hydrophobic residues, meaning that the pattern of these residues that hate water is different. It's marked by their numbers here. So what he did is he measured the kinetic of association. So I'm trying, um, I'm explaining. The y-axis is the observed rate. And then the x-axis is the uh, peptide target concentration. The slope here will tell us the rate, how fast it binds to comodulin. So it, in the experimental condition, he found that the association rate for chyme kinase 1 is twice as fast as chyme kinase 2. You would say, so what? The factor of 2 doesn't seem to be 
impressive to a physicist. We're dealing with you know billions of billions of years in the universe. Factor of two seems like nothing. But let me uh, give you this perspective. If today your salary suddenly doubled, how do you feel? Pretty cool. This is basically how the cell feels because inside a cell is a very competitive environment. You have a small edge up or actually uh, have a, a large benefit. Okay, so given the fact that they are the same length, they have the same net charge, according to the theory, they should have very the same association rate. So if there are significant difference between the two, factor of two, then it must happen after they form contacts. So how do we actually investigate or test this hypothesis? That's why we need modeling, simulations, and physics uh, to understand how things work. First of all, we like to build models. Um, physicists, we build protein models as well. One way to build it is to include every single atom. It's great such a model exists, but it has a big drawback. It takes too much resources to even move a local movement fluctuations. And there's a limit in the number of um, amino acids you can simulate in that box. So physicist's way is to coarse grain that, meaning that I make into a low resolution um, a protein model that allow a longer integration time step. Okay, so every amino acid, I only use two beads. One bead traces the backbone, and one bead capture the, the chemistry of that amino acid. And once we have that representation, we need to develop a model to basically let them act like a protein or act like a commodulin. So we have the interactions for commodulin, interaction for target, and interaction between commodulin and target. And it's important that in our model, we do not bias towards a known complex. So we wanted the, the model to really mimic how the commodulin would act in a solution. So the interactions for commodulin target, uh, they break it down into several terms. The first term is to capture the connectivity, the fact that they did not fall apart. We do not have quantum mechanical uh, nature in the simulations because it's coarse graining. Uh, if you want to consider um, quantum chemical nature, you want the interaction has to be much faster than femtosecond. Over here, we're talking about nanosecond. So the, in, the bonding between the two adjacent amino acids is captured by a harmonic spring, so they vibrate. And you have angular um, bonds that represent you fix the particular uh, angle. And you have dihedrals, which means that you have the torsion of the backbone. And chirality capture the handedness of the side chain. Once we have the structures, then we also include the van der Waals interactions that captures the dispersion interaction, or we say capture the chemistry of the amino acids. We capture the hydrogen bonding interactions. Hydrogen bonding is a unique feature of biological molecules that allow them to form directional interactions with each other and with the solvent. We also include electrostatic interactions, but because it's in solvents, not in vacuum, so we basically included di dielectric um, uh, in constant of uh, 80 in water and also include the ionic strength to properly account for the screening effect. And for the interfacial interactions, they have van der Waals, hydrogen bonding, and electrostatic interactions. Having all that, then we are ready to run a simulation. So let's take a look at what a typical simulation will look like. Here I'm going to show you in the middle is commodulin. You have four calciums on the screen. And this is a little target. And you'll see that this target will first look around and then steer to a particular domain through electrostatic interactions. And then, because of thermal fluctuations, they will further form, collapse, and bind. And we do that for thousands of thousands of times. That's why we need supercomputing uh, power to simulate these trajectories. And we collect them um, through a probabilistic um, distribution, and that is called the beta. Oops. 
Okay. So how do I compute rate from these individual simulations? What I would do, this is basically an expression derived from Smoluchowski's equation. So this is a guy who actually figured out how things move, how fast uh, the, the particles move in solution. They said that he kind of modeled uh, the association effect of the two particles coming together into two zones. One zone, is, if I define a collision zone, then the molecular details between the two uh, pa partners are important. Uh, but if outside a zone, I can just simply feel like, you know, the two doesn't really know each other, they're freely diffusing. So as a result, the rate is the multiplication of these two factors. One is the diffusional uh, coefficient, uh, rate constant outside of a sphere, sphere with a radius b. And the second part is about the molecular detail of how the two particles uh, will collide. And beta represents the probability that they will successfully form in uh, encounter complex. Because each time they collide, they may just bounce off. But it may take several tries for them to really form a meaningful complex. So basically, this is one promise, just one equation. Your physics crowd, I can show you some equations. So the, basically, this is a to uh, uh, show you a collision zone. Q is actually much larger. I just basically make it into something smaller. And I simulate this process thousands of times. And then collect the probability of forming a, a uh, you know, chance of forming the content. And omega here is a quality control. You can see that if I cheat by having a very small, um, small sphere, then of course, I'm going to guarantee so event, successful event all the time. So this gives you a penalty. And I also call it graduate student factor because, you know, in principle, I like to set the boundary as far as possible. But the graduate students want to graduate in four or five years, so you can't really do that. So usually it's like an optimum. The students will figure out what is the optimal size of the, of the omega. In our case, 0.2. Okay. So the question is, when this type of algorithm was developed, you know, years ago, it was tested on a hard sphere. In a hard sphere, it's easy for them to identify what is a successful content. But here, these two objects are changing interfaces all the time. How do we define a successful event? What is an encounter complex? So we go back and ask the experimentalists. So this is a way to do research is to communicate with the experimentalists back and forth and get some ideas. When they measure the rate, they are actually essentially measure the intensity of a fluorescence dye tagged on the position 75. So when there's association event, that intensity will change. So they can't really say if they form an encounter complex or not. Using the same idea, I say now I define a zone of interaction. And if there are contacts between the two that forms uh, within about two, um, about eight angstroms, then I consider a contact. And I called an order parameter Z75. If I said today I count five contacts in the zone between the target and comodulin, encounter complex, I can use that expression and compute my rate. And you can see that it's not much different. But when I cr increase the threshold of Z75, I say I have to form nine contacts between the two in order to call a successful event. You see that a factor of two appears. So obviously, that forming more contacts, a more tightly formed interface, is critical to explain the differences uh, in the in the experimental measurement. Then the question is, OK, great, why was that? How does it happen? To do simulations, that's wonderful. That's like what reason I got hooked uh, when I do uh, research as an undergrad. So when I was an undergrad, I went to lab rotations or do REUs in many laboratories. But not until I went to um, I joined a computational lab, I got completely hooked. I love the fact that I know what I'm doing most of the time. <laughs> so when I think something interesting, I can load the trajectories and visualize that on my screen. And what I see is that this is a order parameter as a function of time. 
there are two major events. One is basically association. Uh, is attraction between the target and the end domain through electrostatic interactions. And both of them had that. But once I, they started to, to even form a more elaborate contact, the two will have to wiggle and adjust to one another and form the final stage is another uh, structural uh, reorganization involve the collapse of two lobes and that part is called late stage. And this part is quite non-trivial. Then the question is why chyme kinase 2 is less accessible than chyme kinase 1. So we use a lot of the concept from physics to analyze the property of uh, biomolecules. We treat them as a type of matter. We call it living matter. You have condensed matter, you have you know, soft matter. Here we use the living matter. Okay? So Z is a represents nonspecific interactions uh, between the target and the end domain. ZC is nonspecific interactions, any interactions between target and the C domain. And Z in the x-axis represents all contacts. If today the target making contact with N domain and C do domain are uh, the same. Then this line should collapse into that black diagonal line. And this is called the mean field model. I mean, everything is the same. But the fact that you have rise and fall, like for example, for this C domain, have to form more than average. And then the N domain is less than average. And eventually, you have to make ways, dip it through to make ways for um, endomates coming in, it denotes a frustration. This frustration is due to topology, meaning that some contest form early on has to open up to make ways for other contests to form. And you can see that such topological frustration was more prominent in comodulin and chyme kinase 2. So we see that, wow, this variation is great. That would uh, delineate the reason why is a, a factor of two slower than chyme kinase one. Then we can ask the next question, why? So it's good about simulation is that we can analyze these results through statistics. So we count. What we do is that we count the number of contacts uh, formed at between the target and, and, and comodulin at the early stage. And we count the contact between the target and comodulin at stage. And then we subtracted the two. And that is the difference of the contact formation of each amino acid on the target. As you can see, that most of them increases, of course. As you move on from following early stage to late stages, you should have more contacts formed. But some contacts are negative, meaning that at late stage, it has to open up and make ways for others to, to form. Then we see that for chyme kinase 1, there are only about one significant uh, residues that is causing such frustration. Whereas for chyme kinase 2, you have a lot. Particularly this, this particularly uh, notion at two, 297 residue index. Then we realize that even though the two targets has the same net charge, but their distribution is very different. For chyme kinase 1, all those net charges are evenly spread out on the amino acids, whereas for chyme kinase 2, all these charged amino acids are clustered at the end domain. So it, be, it forms a very strong Velcro. So it sticks to the comodulin. Uh, it takes a lot more effort to, uh, to shake it off. So once we have that, as a scientist, we found something new. The community might appreciate what we do. And we come up with a new mechanism saying that, you know, how does a comodulin uh, recognize its target is through a conformational and mutually induced fit, meaning that because it has to interact, comodulin has to interact with 300 different targets. It has to go through some secret handshake with its target in order to select which type of bounding complex is reasonable. So the question is, now we know the path going to uh, chyme kinase 2. But what about the path going to the other way? All right? So obviously that we know that the, the signaling, uh, the, the binding, binding mechanism is influenced by calcium. So what is the role of calcium in all of this? 
And it is uh, inspired by, motivated by early experimental work about 15 years ago. That my collaborator have done a very be a, a beautiful work. So how to read this diagram? What he has to do is that he measure the amount of calcium released by commodulin, as in y-axis. And then he measured the time, of course, in x-axis. Note that in the on the left, when it binds to neurogranin, everything happened in less than a second. Whereas you take a look on the right, everything happened beyond the, a second. So let's go take a look. Within a second in neurogranin, so basically you have a, a profile that traces the uh, number of calcium being released over a period of time. But when he added neurogranin into a peptide, you see that rate suddenly increases, meaning that addition of neurogranin promotes the release, release of calcium. So target binding promotes calcium release. However, on the other hand, if you take a look at it, so this profile cam is the same profile as this one, but it's just on a different uh, time scale, so it looks a little bit different. So you add chyme kinase to target peptide, you basically re slow down the kinetics to release calcium. And if you add a phosphorylated chyme kinase to, you find that the time to retain in a bound state increases. That means target binding retain calcium binding. So obviously, comodulin can retain calcium, can uh, you know, release calcium, modulated by different target. And why was that? So usually, as a graduate student, most of the time uh, doing research involve reading literatures because this is basically what we dig through the old work and see what are the pieces of information that is uh, undiscovered. We basically, you know flip over all the rocks and see what information has not tapped. With neurogranin, there's not, very, not a lot of information. But we know if there's some mice knock off the, the neurogranin, so they can basically grow, uh, grow some type of mice without specific peptide. And then they can train this mouse through a water maze, about uh, a big maze, about three meters in diameter, and have a markers and put train the mouse go through the maze. Train a couple of times a day. And then after three days, they fill the maze with water so the mouse cannot see where the path will be. And then they're going to uh, record how successful the mouse or how long the time to take a mouse for them to reach to the exit. So they can actually see, like, you know, what is the effect of this particular amino acid? It did actually, some mice, if you have taken one, um, one, um, one peptide out, they will not learn. Some, pept some peptide been removed, they cannot remember. They can learn, but cannot remember. So for this particular knockout mice, is that if you take it out, it suddenly loses all the spatial uh, understanding, cannot really recognize the markers on the maze that help them to go through uh, the exit. Okay, and biochemically, neurogranin has a higher binding affinity for commodulin without calcium, we call apocam, than holocam, meaning commodulin with calcium. And this behavior is drastic different than most of the commodulin binding targets. And interestingly, that what how the biochemists would do is that now they know this peptide is important. What they do is that they chop down different pieces. And then they actually measure the biochemical property with these small segments. And they identify that if without these particular segments in blue, they call it acidic domain, if they only have the binding domain, then this peptide loses its ability to manipulate calcium binding. So somehow this is important, but we don't know. Unfortunately, there's no structure available for this complex then we have to rely on modeling and limited experimental approach to uh, model what does it look like. So how do we do it? We still use the coarse grain models, and then now allow us to uh, model what is a possible uh, complex will look like. So this is where the machine learning comes in. It seems like, wow, this is such a trendy name. But in physicists, we do that all the time. We just didn't call it machine learning. We have some non-sexy name called self-assembled neural net clustering. Machine learning sounds better, isn't it? <laughs> so what they do is that 
using a nuclear magnetic resonance. This is an experimental technique uh, to use it to de de uh, decide the spatial distance between um, between uh, the isotopes in in molecules. And then each little bar here represents a signal when neural grounding binds. So we use this as a feature to train our database. You can see that if you want to have a simulation, so if we present it in a complex system in terms of energy landscape, we have the y-axis is the number of contacts, and x-axis is the distance between the two. And each data point here represents you know, the distribution of the data. Then we, among millions of complexes, we use the limited experiments as feature to fish out, to learn what the structure will look like, and this is what we get. Now, what do we learn? After machine learning, you have to learn something, too. <laughs> Sometimes not all information are useful. Okay? We found that commodulin is still extended. It hasn't collapsed. And neurogranin did not form a beautiful helix. It has a kink. So once we have this structure, so we want to say why this structure is so peculiar that affects commodulin's ability to retain calcium. Then we turn in to do all atom simulations. Not all atom, we do quantum mechanical calculations. All right. So these are the structures obtained from the PD protein data bank. And this is a structure from protein data bank. And this is a structure from our simulations. We basically solvate them tune in the right pH, uh, set the correct ionic strength, and the system became very, very large. I mean, it con contains hundreds of thousands of atoms, including water. And then we run it um, uh, under, under room temperature. Then how to compute the binding energy of the calcium when we turn to physics? In physics, there is a way to compute free energy through non-equilibrium work. It's called Jarzinski's equality. He's still alive and well, okay? And he's about 60 years old. Okay. So what he does, what the, the algorithm is, is that I have a, a state bound state, calcium bound state, and calcium re release state. Basically, I have this nano tweezer, aka some kind of forces I act uh, exerted on my bead, and then I pull it very, very fast thousands of times. Each pool costs about a month of calculations. All right, so that's why we need uh, high performance computing as well. And we need to co compute this uh, processes at random directions for thousands of times until the data converge. Then we can get the free energy difference between the two, and that translates into calcium affinity. So how to read the data? So here we have Delta G, G represents free energy, ba calcium bound state and calcium unbound state. The second delta, you can see delta, delta, the second delta represents without a target and with a target. So if delta, delta G is negative, meaning that calcium binding will retain calcium. If delta, delta G is positive, meaning that target binding will basically release, promote the release of calcium. So we do that, and we do serious calculations, and we compare with experiments. This is usually how we validate our approach. On the last rows are the experimental data. Uh, these are the free energy, delta, delta G, kcal per mole, per uh, calcium binding site. And for uh, homocomodulin, so with calcium, is minus 3.3 kcal per mole. And for neurogranning, is 2.5. Saying that, negative means uh, Time kind of binding promotes calcium, whereas neurogranin binding will decrease its affinity. And look at our calculations. For the uh, holocam, the number is really close. Even if you say it's not the same, but let me tell you that if you're a computational scientist, you'll, you'll cry when you see this number. It's actually pretty good. And for holo, uh, ma holocam and neurogranin, we didn't get it very close. You can see, wow, this is really a big number. It's exponential. Uh, but however, it's still positive. So we think that it's probably due to the limitation of modeling, and sampling also matters. But at least it's positive. Then doing simulations allow us to look at why. This is why I like molecular simulations. 
is that now I take those structures and I zoom it in. Why was that? So this is a canonical bound complex of commodulin and a target. A target is in translucent <coughs> background. You, if you blow it up, you see that this is a rod, the helical form. And these two loops are the two calcium binding loop of commodulin that wrap around the target. And you see that there's additional hydrogen bonding between these two calcium binding sites. And this additional hydrogen bonding further stabilizes the structure of the calcium binding loops, and that retains calcium. That makes sense? And then for the other one, because neurogranin does not form helical content, so it does not have this benefit. On the other hand, this acidic domain that I mentioned before, they actually stick outward and sit right between these calcium binding sites. You can see that, stick right in between them. So as a res result, you can't form this nice beta scaffold between the two. And that's destabilized calcium binding loop. So as a result, they will promote calcium dissociation whenever neurogranin binds. So we're able to understand this at a molecular level. So I like to, uh, how many time, how much time do I have? Um, let me check something. She said the slides are on blackboard anymore. Yeah. I'm not sure what's going on. Do you have time? Is it okay? Is this a, not too, is it fast so far? Oh. Okay. Oh, you know what? Uh -huh. The sharing must have stopped. Ooh. Do you have any students wanting to do summer research uh, at the CTPP? If you want to, I'm actually receiving applications to um, recruit students to do research at the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics. We can talk about that. Okay. So the next question I think is more disturbing. And so what is the biology of mind? The new biology of mind is potentially more disturbing because it suggests that not only the body, but also mind and the specific molecules that underlie our highest mental processes, consciousness of self and of others, consciousness of the past and the future, all evolve from our animal ancestors. This is pretty scary. So let me tell you a very scary uh, information. So this is the basically uh, what we do is that we're trying to find the similarity uh, of commodulin between human, cow, fruit fly, bacteria, rat, chicken, mouse, and frog. What it tells us that for all the vertebrates, that means yes, us, pig, frog, fish, anything has a vertebrate, has the identical commodulins, 148 of them. That means any mutation will lead to fatal development. So this is a highly conserved molecule. You have the same commodular molecule that translate calcium in a fish, in a frog, and in, in us. The only thing that's very different is soybeans, yeast, and bacteria. So maybe, maybe we come up with an in interesting idea. Perhaps physics is an evolutionary constraint. We heard about a lot of interactions could be constrained, but perhaps how things move is a constraint as well. So how do we actually test our hypothesis is that we basically study the function, the sequence, the structure of commodulin using biophysics and evolution biology to do that. And luckily, we're in the medical center. The world's best evolutionary biologist is in Baylor's. It developed a, a software called Evolutionary Trace. We can just load our sequence in, and it could tell us how important each amino acid would be in an in a evolutionary scale. And another one is that uh, another great one of the one, uh, best uh, protein folding biophysicists at Rice University. He developed a frustratometers that tell us the uh, physical property of interactions and, uh, for a protein. You can measure it by a frustratometer. If it's, the residue is happy to be in that position, it marked green. If the residue is not happy because of the energetics uh, come from fr frustration, then we got highlight in red. So once we have that, then we lay out those data. You know, right now, people like to say big data. Okay? But data is big already. The only idea is that it's not the data that's interesting. is how to think about it. Make it valuable is interesting. That's why you, have to, you like to major in physics, right? How things work. If we lay out those data that looks very colorful, has no meaning. Uh, but however, if we wanted to project them, 
into three-dimensional structures, it would be something interesting. Let me first just explain what that diagram would be. In the y-axis is the evolution score. Anything less than five means super important in the evolution sense. Anything greater than five, not possibly, still evolving. In the x-axis, uh, positive meaning minimally frustrated, meaning they're happy residues, they're happy where they are. And then negative represents um, unhappy residues, right? I mean that they will not be happy of where they are because of energy frustrations. There are some conflicts that they don't want to be there. So if we color these residues on three-dimensional structures, just look by human eyes. Human eyes are the best uh, algorithms than anything. You immediately see clusters of stuff, didn't you? So this is why, you know, whenever the students wanted to do simulations or do research, I say, first look at it. Does it make sense or not, right? Because you have to pass our human brain first. So let's take a look. The first one has uh, minimally frustrated, happy residues, highly conserved. Oh, they are really reasonable. They are conserved. They are forming folding scaffold. Now we've known proteins like to have a folding scaffold. That's why they fold in, in biological scale. Another one we see, oh, they are highly frustrated. They are not happy where they are. They move a lot. But they are highly uh, uh, evolution conserved. So these are calcium binding sites. Of course, these functional states, they move around. It stopped advancing. Okay. So both of them are uh, reasonable in a sense. Some places like to fluctuate a lot because they have to. It's a calcium binding site. Some of them had to remain... Um, you know, stable. Okay. And what's getting interesting from this data is that we found some regions there are happy residues, they are not conserved. And these are the residues at the interface between target and commodulin. So you think about these places are like cassettes. Like if you compile a software, you don't need all of the features in a software. I just compile some of them. So these are like cassettes you can actually shuffle whenever the function is needed. So we call it these are modular amino acids. The last one actually is pretty surprising, meaning that they are not happy residues and they are still evolving. And we noticed that this is a particular residue called tyrosine-99 that is not located at the interface between commodulin and the protein, it is not located at anywhere. It's actually located at the back of the commodulin. And that particular place is where the commodulin get phosphorylated. So if you think about it, wow, this is pretty cool. Because if we look at the evolutionary tree analysis, let me tell you that. The nature has designed the best, most stable commodulin in East. In East, this particular region is availing, is a highly oily residue, very happy to be there. But when it started to evolve, become a soybean, and this one will become phenylalanine, meaning that it started to become less oily. Interestingly, when it evolved from phenylalanine to tyrosine 99, this is where the, the current, where the Drosophila moved to fish. And this mutation happens at the sodium potassium ion pump. So this is, means that when a fish sort of evolve in, in the seawater, they need to start pumping out calcium and this particular amino acid mutation would contribute to this uh, more elaborated function. And what's scary to tell you that it's still evolving. So meaning that there's still potential for us to evolve into another feature, more powerful one. I don't know what that is. Okay. So one thing that we learned is that we can also analyze um, the history of these mutations. And we learn something. If we take a look at the 9-methionines amino acids from the ancient form, like yeast to now, we found that the protein is less and less stable. The most stable ones will be in yeast, but it's not interesting. But the, when you get into multicellular function, involve you know, the organization between different tissues, then this protein becomes more dynamic, more flexible. We call it oil out. So the fact that the protein has to move is an important feature for us to evolve. Okay, so this is conclusion and outlook. Conformational and mutually induced fit as a mechanism for commodulin to recognize target that lacks distinct uh, structures. 
And Camodulin's uh, progressive mechanism target binding regulates its calcium binding affinity. We also understand the acidic region of neurogranin is key to lessen binding affinity for, of camodulin for calcium. Is by di bidirectional binding of camodulin target is critical to the reciprocal relation to calcium affinity. And we think that the dynamics is a evolutionary driving force for promiscuous proteins like camodulin to achieve its binding multi-specificity multi and diverse biological functions. Okay. And uh, the acknowledgement, I'd like to thank my students, particularly former students, PhD student Peng Zhizhang and master students uh, Hua Chen, and uh, former graduate students Qian Wang and former postdocs Ruanandu Tripathi, um, and my collaborators at UTH, Neil Waxen, do experiments in Lu do a bioinformatic and evolutionary study, studies on them, and the research funding from the National Science Foundation. Uh, National Institute of Health, Department of Energy, and Center for Theoretical Biological Physics at Rice University. And I thank you for your attention. If any questions or interested in doing research summer at CDPP, please let me know. Thank you. Questions? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, good questions. I think the, the, the we use pretty low level, uh, mostly uh, for C, Fortran, to do the molecular simulations. But for visualization and data analysis, we use Python, MATLAB uh, for these purposes, modeling purposes. Yeah. What do you use for like pre built libraries also to facilitate the Building of this model. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't write from scratch anymore. Everything is very modular. So as long as you know how to write hello world, you're very close to understanding you know, how things work. Yeah. The barrier to do computational research is not that high. And then most of the part is to have confidence in yourself that you can self-learn and you can do it. Usually, I learn programming by buying a book uh, teach myself, teach yourself C in, in 21 days. You know, those are the kind of self-taught books. But I think nowadays we have Coursera. We have many free uh, uh, Udemy, many free softwares or YouTubes that can help you to learn that. And at UH, we also have workshops that uh, provide free uh, tutorials for students just to learn some R or MATLAB or Python and so forth like that. It's very useful. I think it's nowadays it's a must for any like job uh, requirement or uh, research program um, or apply to any research program. You must have that, either experiments or theory. That's a pretty fair statement. So, this presentation is more about the current state of the world and the learning process happens in the university and everything. What, have you ever researched for, um, Oh, it's not in my specialty, but the answer is yes. A lot of like bioengineering imaging using functional MRI, they can actually image what kind of uh, activities there are in your brain whenever uh, some specific emotion is being provoked. So if you're a type of research like that, you know, uh, if you're interested in doing this, and then Texas Medical Center has a world best research in this aspect. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah? Oh, of course. They actually have a, uh, you know, the birth of all the machine learning is actually started from the 70s when the physicists wanted to understand how to model uh, networks in brain. So, there are actually lots of very active research using uh, network theories or uh, many different type of, uh, I would say, modeling approach to understand how to retain memory, how memory is being associated. 
So if you, I mean, I'm using a layman's language because I'm not an expert. I'm just a layman's language. Is that how does we learn? We learn through association with others, right? So that's why a lot of times some some events will trigger will a lot of emotions or trigger us to remember some kind of things long for, forgotten ago. It's because in our brain, what the Hebb's theory theorem has saying the the, the the neuron stayed together, fire together. So a lot of these times, this connectivity has been reused and rewired to learn or retrieve information for, di for different, uh, different uh, activities. So someone, you know, if you think about those super memory people, how do they actually enhance their memories, trying to connect their, their, their thoughts, information together so you can you know, retrieve them better. So these are some of the I think interesting research areas. If I'm not doing this, I'm probably doing that. I don't know if this is something that's that's true or not. I think uh, nobody can really experiment with the human brain, right? They only use mouse models, and how does the results from mouse models will can be applied to human is another story. So I don't know. Yeah. You can see that this is a highly delicate uh, machine, and then you, there's some glitches. I think <laughs> you can expect some glitches happens. Yeah, yeah, they can do that. There are lots of interesting things. Is that so? My my collaborator is actually it's pretty gross if you think about it. Is that how do you actually um, get those uh, cells? Is that you train the mice, right, and then you kill them, and then you basically slice them and observe their behavior. Or what you can do is that usually you know is they can if you wanted to really like like stimulate neuron cells actually these nerve cells are harvested on mouse when they're still in the, in the belly of the pregnant mice. Yeah, so there's lots of very gross things going on. Yeah, but as I was saying, I mean, some people like it. I know that's why I think we major in physics. <laughs> I can tell you something interesting. When I was undergraduate students, I I, 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 I knew that I don't like it, wet lab is because when I um, join a group and then the postdoc tell me that, oh, meet me 7 o'clock in the morning at a slaughterhouse. I was like, why am I going to slaughterhouse? But I went, it's because we want to harvest a, a, a bovine brain, cow brain from a slaughterhouse. So we need a fresh and put it in the ice bu bucket <laughs> <laughs> and carry and I went to purify them to collect the protein. Said, no, that's it. That's it. Not for me. <laughs> But sometimes you need that experience to know what you don't like. So that's why I think that it is important at your stage just to try out. Just put your foot in a door, whether it's something you like or not. And then probably you open doors, right? Sometimes you know, OK, you don't like this or you like that, and help you shape what you wanted to do in, in, in the future, professional school, grad school, or even work. I mean, at the end, you probably say, no, I, that's enough for me. I don't like to do science at all. I want to be an Elon Musk and, and set up a SpaceX. He has a, a degree in physics and then doing business, I think, very successful. So why not? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So do you know how this is effective, like cognitive therapy? Oh, yeah, it is. This is the, the sole motivation for why these neuroscientists wanted to know, because they wanted to know how the mechanism work, how the, uh, these mechanisms actually regulated to what key proteins. And there are drugs actually targeting comodulin to make them like, more, work more effectively. And there's a reason why we, we, heard about, no, we heard about lead poisoning, right? And then we know why is that. It's because if lead is in, in, being absorbed, it will displace calcium, but it will not never going to leave that place. So you have an activated commodulin all the time. You see how exhausting it would be. That's why whenever you have lead poisoning, it's irreversible. 
it got permanent damage. So understanding these things also have this environmental impact. Yeah, question? Oh, yeah. Well, my goodness, you're so up to the literature. This is great. So there are research studies showing that the so-called epigenetics is the decoration on the DNAs. What affect how the DNA pack? Because once you pack, you can express different proteins, and that impacts the function or the phenotype of the, the, the cells. So it has been shown in various studies is how the epigenetics, epi means outside environment, how the how the, the, the fact that you were exposed to, that how the history of your parents or how your, the habit of yourself impacted the way your genome folds and eventually uh, impacted how it was expressed. So not only neural cells, I think it, it actually it can impact every single aspect uh, of, your, of your expression because you know that in, in, in our human body, even though they had different shape and different sizes, but all cells share the same DNA, right? So my, the, the, my skin cells, my muscle cells, they share the same DNA. The reason they are different is because they are expressed differently. So how do they express differently is because that you can have the same sequence, but they pack and fold differently. So as a result, that when they got expressed, the different part of the D, the, the uh, this space is expressed, being compiled. So that's why, you know, it's very interesting when you know everything can be explained in molecular level, you get more self, like health conscious. <laughs> so how many atoms are involved in your simulation? Uh, this is coarse grained models. Coarse grained models are kind of controlled with 1,000 beads. But if it's all atom, I can go to 100K, 100K, 100,000. Yeah. It's a tiny piece compared to yours.